Hello, everyone. Welcome to Encrypt Your Volumes with Barbican. Uh, let's talk about the agenda today. We're going to start off with uh, just some introductions about myself and the company I work for, OnRamp. Also, why you should encrypt your volumes. Uh, key managers, or specifically we're talking about Barbican today, uh, but there are a couple others out there. And how it works uh, with its integration with Nova and Cinder. Uh, the story of how we came to implement Barbican uh, to enable this service. And some of the gotchas and limitations as well that we've discovered after uh, running it for a year and a half. And then if there's time, we should, uh, be, able, I should be able to show you a demo of the, uh, the process to uh, encrypt the volumes and what the traffic looks like to Barbican, and time for some questions. So, a little bit about me. Uh, my previous experience was actually working for a global training provider where I was responsible for developing lab infrastructure uh, for training courses. A lot of my early infrastructure as a service experience actually comes from the VMware side, uh, deploying the uh, vApps on vCloud Director. Uh, we looked into using lower cost solutions. Uh, that's when we started looking into OpenStack and I did a couple different POCs, starting off with uh, just Icehouse uh, deployed on Ubuntu. We also looked at the uh, Juno release uh, using the Canonical's um, Metal as a Service with Juju for orchestration. And did, did a couple of POCs also with the RDO project, which is uh, what I'm going to be showing today. But the uh, we're currently running on the Newton release with a managed control plane uh, provided by Platform 9. Uh, and I was uh, hired last year uh, to work as an OpenStack engineer to, at OnRamp, uh, and I've led the development of our uh, Barbican and encrypted volume support. All right, so many of you have probably heard of the uh, keep it simple, stupid, or the KISS principle. This is actually my main design philosophy. Uh, having worked for small, highly diverse operations teams over the years, this philosophy has actually always produced products for me with fewer bugs, which is easier to diagnose and easier to understand documentation and add features. But, and many of you have probably seen this slide before, OpenStack is not exactly the simplest thing, right? Well, it's not as bad as pictures like this make it seem. It's actually just a microservice-based virtualization manager built for scale. So. You really only need to deploy the services you need, and, but this can present a challenge for small teams to operate efficiently at scale, uh, hence the need for service providers like OnRamp. So a little bit about OnRamp. OnRamp is a high trust certified data center uh, services company. We're actually based out of Austin, Texas. We have two data centers there, uh, and we also have a data center in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, all of our data centers are world-class facilities with fully redundant network and power paths. Uh, last year, we released our virtual private cloud product, which is built on OpenStack. Uh, in addition to the OpenStack API, we provide our customers uh, pre-hardened Linux and Windows images uh, and provide usage-based billing to allow for burstable cloud workloads. Okay, so why should you encrypt? Well, one of the big reasons is to protect yourself against data leaks. Well, what kind of data would you want to protect against? Well, personal health information is one. Uh, also, credit card payment data if you want to aim for PCI compliance. And maybe just intellectual property, something you do, if you have a multi-tenant environment, you don't want uh, any of this information being shared between tenants, and this is a better way to safeguard that. Compliance is also a big reason why you might want to uh, u utilize encryption. Uh, specifically, HIPAA requires encryption for data at rest and in transit for that personal health information. Also, the PCI uh, compliance requirement does require encryption for the same type of things for at rest and in transit. It's also just good practice if, you're having a, if you have a shared hosting environment for each tenant to have only access to their own stuff, right? They don't, you don't want, uh, and the tenant, or per tenant and per volume encryption keys uh, kind of facilitate this. So why use a key manager? Well. Perhaps a better question is, what is a key manager, right? Uh, key managers are basically the equivalent of password managers that you might be familiar with uh, using the, with your web browser. The only difference in this case is instead of storing your personal passwords, they're storing your services passwords. Uh, and there's, it's a, just a security best practice to use key managers, and it's mentioned in many of those compliance requirements. 
And a good analogy here is, you know, you wouldn't leave your keys in your car, so you probably shouldn't leave your uh, encryption keys next to the data on your servers. So that's why you would want a key manager. It's also a compliance requirement. Uh, some specific uh, mentions from the PCI requirements was that you should store your uh, keys in the fewest possible locations. Uh, as well, you should store uh, secret and private keys used to encrypt and decrypt the cardholder data uh, using a key encryption key or a KEC uh, that is as strong as the encryption key itself, at least. Uh, the HIPAA and high trust requirements also uh, mention that you should store those keys separately from your encrypted data and that your key manager system should be physically protected by the fewest number of custodians necessary. Uh, so what is Barbican? Barbican is an open source secret storage service written specifically for OpenStack. It was designed by the developers at Rackspace and was originally introduced with the Icehouse release. Uh, some of the things it provides, it's a uh, REST API for secrets management. It does have pluggable backends. Uh, two notable backends that it supports are the Simple Crypto plugin, which allows you to store your key encryption key that I mentioned earlier, right within the Barbican configuration file itself. Uh, the other options uh, available for you are your uh, high, uh, the HSM support, which is the hardware security modules, uh, and it supports a variety of protocols, including the PKCS11 and the key manager uh, over IP protocols. Uh, for uh, If you have a, a stronger need for storing your passwords uh, or your key encryption key in a tamper-proof device, that's... Uh, you can spend a little bit more money and, and add an HSM to your uh, setup with uh, that kind of plugin. Uh, Barbican does provide inter integration with Nova, Cinder, Swift, and many other of the OpenStack related projects. And it also integrates with Keystone for authentication and role based access control. And like many other OpenStack projects, it is built to scale. So it, you can horizontally scale out your workers, your API nodes. Uh, and it can scale to very large sizes, so it was, it was designed for that. Just a couple of things I'd like to list that it does not provide, or Barbican does not provide, uh, is a graphical user interface. There's not uh, a user interface within the uh, Horizon project currently for managing your keys. Uh, it's all, uh, there is a CLI but, uh, and an API that you can use, but right now it's, uh, it's limited to that. Uh, so key splitting for secure import of plain text keys. Uh, so if you, the idea behind this is if you want to uh, download your encrypted volume uh, in an encrypted form and then get those keys out but not have a single person with access to the key that can decrypt that volume, uh, a compliance requirement is that you have multiple key custodians. So that, that feature is not currently there, but uh, someone could certainly uh, add that to the user interface if one ever becomes available. Uh, also, since the Pike release, uh, the Barbican service uh, no longer generates the X509 or your SSL uh, certificates. Uh, that was deprecated. Uh, but so it's now just a generic uh, secret store. And it doesn't support, well, I should say it doesn't provide volume encryption, right? Uh, well, what about volume encryption? Well, the types of volume encryption that we're talking about today is the Lux uh, encryption, which is the Linux unified key setup. Uh, Lux allows for multiple user keys and a master key uh, per volume, but in, in this case, Barbican's just using the master key, so that's always going to be unique per volume. Uh, and it does support CPU hardware acceleration, so the, uh, the decryption of, of your storage provided by uh, uh, Lux is going to be very fast. Uh, it's integrated with Crypt Setup and DMCrypt on, on previous releases. Uh, this decrypts the full volume to a local block device and then maps it to uh, your instance uh, with a symlink. And it protects your iSCSI attached volumes. So if you're using a, uh, like Ceph or one of the other uh, block storage providers, uh, there is Barbican support, but it's not going to use the same uh, Lux provider. It's just you're getting uh, data at rest encryption there and not uh, in transit. 
Uh, it also can protect your ephemeral storage if you're using LVM uh, for, for local storage. Uh, new in the, in the Queen's release also, they uh, have now uh, native Lux support uh, built into QEMU and libvirt. Uh, so that improves the, the workflows just a little bit. All right, and uh, one of the coolest features I think about uh, using encryption with Barbican is that since the uh, uh, fantastic work done by the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and others, that we have transparent encryption in Nova and Cinder. Uh, so we do have that integration that exists. Uh, volume decryption in this case happens on the hypervisor instead of within the guest OS. This is great because it means you do not need an agent to install on your, on your operating system in order to mount those decrypted volumes. Uh, if you uh, were familiar with Barbican and it's when it was originally uh, uh, introduced, they, uh, the, there was a lot of uh, proof of concepts for host agents to be able to mount in, in these volumes. Uh, that's actually what I ended up looking into first, but uh, I was very pleased to find out that the transparent encryption uh, was introduced because it means, like I said, no agents. That also means it can work with any operating system, uh, Linux or Windows or whatever else you want to run on there. It's going to be transparent to your operating system. Uh, and it works with bootable volumes as well. And it will protect that data at rest as well as in transit to your hypervisor since the the Lux packets do not get decrypted until they get to the hypervisor. And every volume in this case is going to be protected by its own uh, unique key. Uh, one implication uh, about you doing full volume encryption uh, I'd like to mention is that uh, if, there is, uh, if your system is compromised uh, and someone gets access to the system, it's not going to protect individual files from access from particular users. It's just going to show up to the operating system like there's no encryption happening at all. It's really happening on the back end. So uh, it's not going to be the, the most secure form of uh, encryption. Like you, there are enterprise solutions that will allow you to use encryption agents uh, that can protect against uh, better against that kind of uh, intrusion. All right, so I'd like to talk a little bit about how it works. Uh, I have a workflow here that I stole off the internet that I'm just going to uh, talk about how uh, the, the workflow is for you when you're going to create a new volume. Uh, first, the user is going to get a token from Keystone, uh, and then they're going to use that token to ask Cinder to create a volume. Uh, after, after they ask Cinder, Cinder has to verify that token uh, to make sure that they are authorized to use it, so they're going to make a jump over to Keystone. Uh, and once we have verified that token, uh, Barbican, our sender uh, is then going to ask Barbican for a key. Now, sender has its own uh, user account and uh, token that it's going to uh, use, and Barbican is also going to verify that to make sure that it's a valid request. If everything's valid and everything works out, Barbican is going to generate that key and return it to sender, in which case sender is going to then store that secret uh, reference uh, in its database as part of the volume metadata. All right, so uh, what about when you want to mount your encrypted volume? Well, the user is going to start off by sending a, uh, a mount request to Nova, and then that uh, keystone is going to be used again to verify the, uh, the token for that request. Uh, if everything's valid, the secret is going to be fetched from uh, sender, actually the secret href, uh, or the URL, uh, and Cinder is going to validate that request as well, and then return that secret uh, reference uh, and attach the volume uh, for the user. So uh, now that the Nova has the secret reference, it's going to re request that secret from Barbican. Barbican's additionally going to request uh, validation for the token, and then return the secret if everything's valid. Uh, now that everything, uh, now that Nova has the secret material, it can uh, decrypt that volume on the on the hypervisor. All right, so I'd like to talk uh, briefly about the on-ramp uh, story of how we came to use uh, Barbican and set things up. Uh, we followed the documentation and then quickly realized, wait a second, some of these docs are pretty terrible. Uh, there's, the information is actually out there, but they're all over the place, so you'll, you'll need to uh, piece together a, a little bit of uh, those docs to get that uh, actually running, but uh, thankfully, 
uh, the Barbican devs and the folks on IRC are super helpful, and I was able to get the, uh, the system up and running pretty quickly. Uh, some of the things that you need to do to get that in, or we had to do to get that running, it was adding some endpoints to Keystone so that a Barbican can be discovered. Uh, well, adding a service user to Keystone for uh, Barbican to use, and also adding a creator role, which is what uh, the role that you would assign to anyone who needs to create an encrypted volume. And then we installed the Barbican API. Uh, so uh, we use a dedicated database server cluster for our Barbican deployment, uh, and we configured the Barbican server itself. So after doing all of that, we had a working Barbican installation. We could use the CLI and store secrets and see traffic coming in to our Barbican system. But there was a couple issues. First off with Cinder, uh, blank and our blank volumes were created successfully according to Cinder. There didn't seem to be an issue with creating volumes. However, we had some problems actually creating those volumes from an image where we had to actually format that Lux volume and then uh, copy data over into it. Uh, we, would, we would have some issues. Uh, also, Nova had some uh, issues actually utilizing Barbican. Uh, it, it wouldn't attach any, any of the encrypted volumes that we were creating. And it wasn't even talking, uh, trying to talk to Barbican. So that was an interesting uh, issue to have. But uh, let's talk about how we solved those. So uh, our first issue with, uh, was actually a problem with key orders not getting to Barbican. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're using a uh, service provider for our control plane. So our Cinder API service is actually not hosted on premise. Uh, it's out in the cloud somewhere. And we have uh, an SSH VPN that is terminated uh, with agents on our compute nodes uh, that's co-located with Cinder volume. Uh, so those uh, requests from Cinder API were just not being forwarded uh, from the uh, Cinder API node back into our local Barbican instance. Uh, what ended up happening, actually, is the Cinder API service was fine with that. It didn't... Uh, uh, it may have thrown errors, but we didn't see them in the logs, but it stored a, uh, a null secret reference in its database and then proceeded to create a blank volume uh, and then reported it, that everything was okay. Uh, the problem came when we tried to mount these volumes. Uh, Cinder API would send to Cinder volume uh, that the href for your secret is null, so it's all zeros. So when it came to actually installing the uh, or requesting the key from Barbican, uh, we would make a request for all zeros to Barbican and Barbican would come back with a 404, we don't know what you're talking about, we don't have a secret at that location. So that's where it broke down and we were unable to actually get that secret material back to sender volume to do the, the mount. All right, so how did we fix this issue? Thankfully, uh, the folks over at uh, Platform 9 worked with us to get a uh, forwarder installed on our local agents that would forward that traffic for the Barbican instance, or the Barbican requests from the cloud-hosted control plane. That would allow our key orders to go through that forwarder and then onto our local instance of Barbican. And then the secret href was, href was returned correctly and stored into the sender database. Uh, so when, and it would still create that uh, that blank encrypted volume just fine. So this time when the mount request would come in, uh, a valid href was uh, retrieved from the database and sender volume was able to request, request that secret ID from Barbican which returned that secret material and we were able to successfully mount that volume. The other issue that I mentioned was we had an issue with uh, Nova not talking to Barbican. Uh, this ended up uh, the, the error that showed up in our logs was that uh, the Barbican, or actually the Nova service when it tried to mount the volume was complaining about a fixed key not being defined. Well, that comes from the conf key manager, which is Nova's default volume encryption. Uh, this is actually built into the, uh, the Nova service and it uses a single fixed key for all volumes. It's pretty much just a placeholder uh, for your uh, for the implementation of volume encryption and so they can do their internal testing uh, without having to depend on other services. Uh, it, it is used to, uh, like I said, for, for testing, but it's definitely not for production. Uh, it does, stores a fixed key that's used, the same key for all your volumes. So, 
the problem we were having was configuring the API class to, to not use Conf Key Manager and to use Barbican instead. Uh, this setting uh, was just being ignored by, uh, by Nova and it was, uh, because of, there was a bug in the code, uh, it was overriding the configured API class with the default AVI, API class. We submitted a bug report and this is thankfully fixed in Pike and newer releases. Uh, if you're running an older release, the manual fix for this is within that Nova uh, code. You can uh, modify your, uh, your init Python file and just comment out the, the section that overwrites that default. So some of the gotchas that we've run into for uh, running encrypted volumes in production. Look out for live migration. So if you're using an older version of uh, OpenStack, uh, older than Queens, uh, it's not supported. So what ends up happening is the volume mounts uh, on, the, on the new host without being decrypted at all. So if your instance had a running database or, or anything actively using that file system, it's no longer seeing a decrypted volume after the migration. It's seeing the encrypted volume. And anything that it's writing to that volume is overwriting and corrupting that in file encryption. Uh, like I said, this is fixed in Queens. Uh, the previous releases were using a sim link on the hypervisor uh, with the crypt set up, ndmcrypt, uh, to, to map that to the instance. The, the newer release uh, has that native uh, QEMU and libvirt support uh, for Lux baked in. So one other issue that we had uh, with uh, the, this is a CentOS uh, RDO packaging issue. Uh, was that Barbican wasn't starting after a boot, uh, after a reboot of the ser uh, server. That actually ended up being the uh, var run Barbican folder uh, was just not created each time. So to fix that, that's just an, uh, a file that you would, or a configuration file you would add to the tempfiles.d folder uh, to allow that uh, to be created on, on a reboot. So that, that fixed that issue for us. We did support, submit a bug report uh, this year for that, so it should hopefully be fixed uh, soon. All right, some of the other, some limitations also uh, with encrypted volumes. Uh, there's currently not a mechanism to rotate those volume encryption keys. So in order to do that, you're gonna need to deploy another volume and manually copy your data over uh, to, in order to rotate those keys. Uh, now, Lux does support multiple user keys, so there might be a cap capability to add this in the future uh, where we can just, in, instead of utilizing the master key for everything, but utilize a, a user key that, uh, that gets swapped out. Uh, there's also no user interface for key management in Horizon. I, I mentioned that earlier, uh, but uh, the things that this would be really nice uh, for was, would be t for securely ex exporting and importing those split keys if you need to uh, remove your data securely and have as few key custodians, or well, more than one key custodian, right? You want to have at least two. Uh, uh, and then also managing your key ACLs. Uh, the uh, access control lists for keys are supported in Barbican, but uh, it would be nice to be able to, to manage these with the user interface, uh, as well as your key expiration and revocation uh, type of uh, management is not uh, currently supported. So uh, some tips uh, that I have for uh, if you're thinking about running Barbican in production, uh, I would make sure that your key manager and your database are secured in a locked cabinet with limited physical access. I would keep that separate uh, and also use a private Barbican uh, instance uh, and endpoint that's not gonna be accessible to your tenants. And if you want to deploy Barbican as a secret management service for your uh, tenants, I would recommend running a separate uh, Barbican database and API nodes uh, for that, just to keep things as separated as possible. Also, this is just regular IT stuff. You know, you should do your automated database backups for any service that's in production, as well as uh, running your database in a highly available manner. Uh, we use Galera, but there's plenty of other SQL uh, ones out there, but that, that one works for us. Uh, also, multiple Barbican API nodes behind a load balancer. It's always a good idea to have a highly available service, uh, and this one is built to scale out, so it's, it works well with that. And of course, you should use your SSL keys uh, to protect those key requests that are in transit to and from your hypervisors. 
All right, let's uh, take a quick look at a demo I've got prepared. This, um, this is actually uh, built on OpenStack uh, Queens uh, on the RDO installation. Uh, uh, submitted uh, or created actually a guide on GitHub, which I'll pro be providing links here in just a minute, uh, uh, and some videos on YouTube that can walk you through the whole process of getting your Barbican POC up. So start off with, we've already got a Barbican running and uh, ready to go, so we've already created our uh, volume types. So, uh, so I'm just going to create first an unencrypted volume uh, so we can compare the difference. And then when I'll create this encrypted volume, you'll see in just a minute on the, on the upper side, we have our Barbican logs, and we'll see the key order come in uh, to place that uh, order for a key. Uh, and then that, is, that information is stored back into the sender database with a reference. Uh, the next, we're going to just uh, create a, uh, an instance uh, so that we can attach our uh, volumes to and, and see how, how this, this works on the back end. So I'm just pulling up a console here. All right, so our instance is running and active. Uh, we'll go ahead and mount our unencrypted volume uh, to the instance. And it takes just a moment. And then we'll go switch over to the uh, instance console and log in uh, so we can uh, mount and write some data to that volume. So as uh, we'll go ahead and switch to sudo so that we can uh, echo some test data uh, to our uh, unencrypted volume. And then verify that we can read that test data back just by uh, looking directly at that volume. Now here's the example of mounting uh, your encrypted volume. And really the only difference uh, between these is the volume type uh, that tells it to be an encrypted volume. And you'll see in just a moment uh, the Nova process is going to make a request to Barbican uh, for the key. All right, so there's our volume uh, being mounted. We're going to write some test data to this volume as well. And then we can verify that from the operating system, uh, we can still read that, that data uh, transparently. It's uh, already decrypted for us. Now, uh, from the controller node, if we take a look at the uh, volume list to get our UUIDs, uh, with RDO, uh, the uh, it's using LVM for the uh, cinder volumes, so we can just directly look at these cinder volumes. And first, we're going to look at the unencrypted volume. And we can see our test data is there, uh, unencrypted. And then we're going to take a look at our encrypted volume as well. And we can see there's a Lux header there that uh, shows that volume is encrypted. Uh, where it's being stored. All right, and that's it for the for the demo. I think we do have time. If anyone has any questions, if you could just uh, step up to the mic and. Uh, can you comment down if the scenario support, uh, for example, the encryption of uh, Ceph RBD based ephemeral storage as a booting drive? Uh, if, if that Ceph storage shows up on the hypervisor as an LVM, uh, but right now I do believe that uh, the, the Ceph integration with Barbican uh, is, is not using the same mechanisms. It's, uh, it does talk to Barbican to retrieve a, a secret, uh, but it's going to utilize that secret on the Ceph backend for data at rest encryption. Uh, what about the volume based? So if I have a sender volume based, I think my previous question is more regarding to the boot drive ephemeral use case mm -hmm. versus cinder volume based Ceph backend. Do you know if that is, is supporting that? 
I wouldn't be able to, I haven't used uh, Ceph for local volume or for ephemeral volumes, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't know uh, the support uh, on that one, but uh, some of the folks in the IRC channel definitely uh, could probably help you with okay. that question. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned at the start support for hardware acceleration. How does that work? Oh, so yeah, so the, the LUX support is actually built into the Linux kernel. Uh, so that's what DMcrypt uh, is actually utilizing in order to uh, mount those volumes. Uh, I read that it was available. I, I wouldn't be able to describe specifically how they've implemented it. Okay, but. so it'd be, and the idea would be that like it would use like something like a Caledo Creek or something like that to accelerate the encryption or something. Like a Caledo Creek's like a hardware compression chip from Intel or something. Yeah, my understanding is it's supported already within the processor, but you might be able to use something else to increase the speed of that. But Okay, and the idea would be that since the hypervisor is doing the encryption, you would need that hardware acceleration like on the compute node that's running the... Uh, the, the VM that's got the encrypted volume? That's correct, but, but it, you do get that uh, as part of your regular Intel and AMD processors uh, support that okay. natively. Yeah. Okay. Which, uh, which secret store backend did you use with Barbican and how did you choose that one? Uh, we're currently using the simple crypto plugin. Uh, there, there is some debate over, over whether that is suitable for production uh, use cases. Uh, since it is storing that uh, secret directly in the in the Barbican comp file, uh, I believe that if you protect that root account and and protect that system uh, to as uh, few people as possible, that that, that can be secure enough uh, for production. And then uh, when you have that requirement for the uh, the HSM, uh, that can be implemented uh, at the same time. Actually, you can have both the the simple crypto and uh, HSM type plugins in use and determine which tenant is going to use that higher level of uh, protection for that key encryption key. Uh, can you comment on your recommendation on using a separate Barbican backend for this versus you know user facing? Uh, my question is, if you recommend have a separate one, how? In the future, the user requests the key rotation on demand by themselves versus infrastructure driven. Uh, I'm sorry, can you ask me that one more time? I guess you suggested in one of your slides that um, for the volume encryption, you use a separate private oh, yeah. become a data store mm -hmm. backend versus uh, user facing, tenant facing. Right. So if you do that, how does the uh, tenant? perform on-demand key rotation request? Okay, so uh, yeah, so the tenant uh, themselves are not going to be accessing that Barbican service. It's going to be the uh, Barbican user running on uh, the compute node is going to, to make that request. Okay. Uh, so the, the, it happens transparently for the user. Uh, so they, they just create an, a new volume uh, using that encrypted volume type, and then from there they can uh, they just manually mount both volumes to their instance and then copy the data over. Uh, it, it, they don't have to make any requests for that key material directly. Uh, that's, that's happening on the back end. But they can, for example, if future support key rotation, they saying every month I have a policy from the tenant perspective I want to rotate my key. How would they be able to do that if they don't have access to Barbican or issue a request on that? Well, I mean, the, if you create a new encrypted volume, it's going to have a new key, so that, that's how they could ensure that the, the key is going to change by taking that, that data and copying it over. I, I think I, okay. I'm not sure if I understand, but yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Hi, I, I have a question about live migration. You said it's not working. Uh, I, I have a question if, is it's, if, it, if it is to your experience. And if it's handled, I mean, you receive error that it's not possible, or you end up with broken instance. Uh, which integration is not working, you said? Uh, live migration, you said. Oh, live migrations. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the, the, the volume, uh, I haven't tested it on the latest release, but from talking to some of the devs uh, on the channel, on RC channel, 
that the, they have changed the way that uh, that encryption works. Uh, it's now integrated directly. So uh, I haven't tested the workflow, so I wouldn't tell you, wouldn't be able to tell you exactly uh, what's changed to allow that. But I know that uh, when you're moving that volume or reattaching the volume on the new server, uh, it's going to take into account the decryption process, whereas previously it was not. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to leave you guys with some uh, information. Uh, I did uh, release the guide that you saw in the short demo. That was actually the end of uh, the demo or the YouTube video that I have. Uh, but I have a, a couple part uh, POC uh, guide that uh, walks you through the installation of Packstack on a single uh, VM for your controller and then a separate VM for your Barbican API that you can set up. Also, definitely check out the IRC channel. I think those folks are super helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, or you can also uh, contact me directly. Uh, I'm at Duncan at randomhack.com or Twitter at randomhack. Uh, and if you're interested in maybe deploying some of uh, that compliant workloads in a public cloud scenario, definitely contact our sales department uh, or check out our site at www.onr.com. All right, that's about it. Thanks, folks, for coming out.